Okay, welcome back, everybody. And we're going into the next round. My name is Francisca Fay. I'm a postdoc at the former Cluster of Excellence and at the FFGE. And I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Olivier Guitar. He is the managing director and the founder of Global Strat, which is a geopolitical risk and security consultancy firm with a regional specialization on Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Mr. Guita was born in Morocco, raised in Spain and France, and educated in Cologne and Paris. And he has gained extensive working experience as a portfolio manager for American financial firms before he shifted his focus from finance to, geopolit to geopolitics and risk analysis. Until 2014, he was the director of research at the Henry Jackson Society, a British foreign policy uh, think tank. And alongside conducting his own research on geopolitics in the MENA region, he was here responsible for setting the strategic agenda for the research department and overseeing the society's academic focus. Mr. Guitin has been ranked as one of the top 250 experts on terrorism in the world and is amongst the top 500 experts on national security and the Maghreb. Amongst the partners he advises are the UK Home Office, the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the European Union, the United States Congress, the NATO, the Swedish and the Belgian Foreign Ministries, and so forth. He has addressed the US Congress as well as parliaments in the UK and in the EU. Olivier Guitar has lectured at the National Defence University and the Joint Special Operations University and his writings on geopolitics and security issues have appeared across a range of prestigious outlets, including the Times, Le Monde, Forbes, World Affairs, Le Tombe, and Al Jazeera. Mr. Guitar frequently appears on international broadcasting outlets, such as the BBC, CNN, and so on. And he regularly, at international conferences, is a dear guest speaker. Today, we're lucky to have him here with us, <laughs> And I would like to pass the word on to him. And yeah, the stage is yours. And sorry, just another word, which I forgot to add. We've had some changes to the programme. Bernard Rougier is not here today. And we're going to have three speakers now and then have that followed by me and Grit and the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a very long introduction. I hope I'll, I'll just get half of your expectations after uh, that presentation. But a, a few things. I would like first to uh, say that I'm not an academic. I spend my time uh, working with security services, with different governments, so from uh, presidents to prime ministers, but also knowing on the field what's happening with, with my journalist friends and uh, people in the opposition. So um, most of my remarks are going to be uh, from the actual things that I've seen for the past 15 years, uh, but also trying to get you to think about issues that, that would make a lot of sense. I'll try to touch on a lot of points and then open up for questions rather than going and, and focusing on one. Um, what is for you all the most dramatic geopolitical slash security event of the 21st century? When I usually ask this question, 95% of the people say 9-11. Uh, I would put to you that the main issue that we have in the 21st century and the main event is the non-British intervention in Syria. This is the moot point of everything. People didn't realize that what happened there have changed what the West represent in the Muslim world. So let me start with an anecdote. Uh, when the vote uh, was being um, looked at uh, in August 2013, after the Ghouta chemical attack and where 1,400 people were gassed by the Assad regime uh, and mostly children, uh, there was the red line of Obama, if you all remember, and uh, both the French, the Brits, and the Americans were supposedly gearing up towards uh, an attack on Assad. Uh, what has happened is that we had the chance of briefing the, the Prime Minister's cabinet uh, of David Cameron before the vote in the UK, but also we briefed a lot of members of parliament. Uh, this happened in August, uh, and to show you how history is changed by just a few mundane events, uh, I can tell you the story that 
20 conservative uh, members of parliament didn't come back from their holiday because they thought that Labour, the left party, would vote for the intervention, which Labour had said they would. The vote was taken down by 13 uh, votes. So if the MPs had come back from vacation, you would have had a British intervention and Obama could not have retracted from uh, intervening. So to put things in perspective and for you to understand why this is pivotal to both the Muslim world and the Western world that this didn't happen, here are the points that we made to, to the, the prime minister at that time. We had a brief with bullet points uh, of the plus and minus of an intervention. But our conclusion stated that even if the UK would not want to do this out of human rights issues, out of the largest migration crisis in history that, that would be coming, they should do it out of their own selfish national security interests. Because our conclusion was, if you don't intervene in Syria in some fashion, doesn't have to be a long campaign like in Iraq and Afghanistan, you will have in the next two years suicide bombers in the streets of London. So the message got across to the prime minister, it got across to the MPs, they understood this, but this is where Islamic State was extremely effective in the war of IDs. Basically, when the uh, intervention didn't happen, you could see a lot, at the beginning it was al-Nusra, al-Qaeda in Syria, that was pushing the narrative that the West doesn't care about you because you are Sunni. And at the same time, if you remember, and that's why geopolitics counts so much in the analysis of terrorism and security, Obama was pushing his hardest to get a nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, and so for a lot of people within the Sunni world, and especially the extremists, they were pushing the uh, narrative that the West has chosen a camp, they're now behind the Shias, and they forget about the Sunnis. Unfortunately for the West, 90% of our communities in Europe, except in Germany, are Sunnis. Uh, and the propaganda of Islamic State started seeping little by little. Uh, and there were two other things that were for them dramatic when you look at how the expansion of Islamic State happened. Summer 2014, the US intervened in Iraq to save the Yazidis. Uh, but de facto, Obama's campaign saved the Shias in, in Iraq. And is the message that Islamic State is pushing is saying, look, there's another example when it came for the time to save the Sunnis in Syria, the Americans didn't come. When it was the time to save the Shias in Iraq, the Americans came. And that's the main issue that the jihadists have been using is actions speak louder than words. And so they go through that narrative. And I can tell you I've been uh, doing and looking at that through social media and that's how they gained traction. If you look at when did the Europeans started going? The big wave was after Ghouta, but also there's a big wave of departures from Western Europe into Syria after the summer of 2014. So my point is really, when you talk to people in the region, is that for now, the West doesn't, is not an honest broker in that 1400 year war uh, between the two sects of Islam, Sunni and Shias. And that's one of the problems that we have today is that we are being viewed by Sunnis as the enemies. I would temper that with one exception is when Donald Trump attacked Syria. That had a little effect in terms of the symbolism of it all. I mean, the main issue had to deal with the symbol of that and what I told the people in the, in the cabinet was, look, I understand you don't want to go into Syria and spend three years there. But as a symbol, when you say that there's a red line, when people are being massacred with chemical attacks, you have to hit Assad, even if it's for two weeks or three weeks, because then you will win the war. And people on the other side, especially jihadists, will not be able to say, look, when it was time to go after Assad, they were not there. 
and that's one of the, of the main mistakes that happened. Interestingly, a year later, the Home Office kept on calling me and asking, what can we do to stop the flow of young Muslims to go into Syria? Why are all those girls uh, from good neighborhood in London going into Syria? I said, look, you have to go after Assad. If you don't understand this and if you don't do it, then you have lost the, the war of ideas. Um, and, and that's one of the, the main points that we have to look at is how much of this is changing the psyche. So there are two other things in terms of the background that makes a lot of sense for you to, to grab. Islamic State is what I call the McDonald's of terrorism. Anyone can come in, eat, uh, leave, and just say, look, I'm part of that group. Uh, Al-Qaeda was never like this. Al-Qaeda was the elitist view of the world that, look, you need to be vetted by 10 people. You need to have that pedigree in order to be joining Al-Qaeda. Islamic State is taking anyone on board that is ready to, uh, to pledge allegiance and claim on their behalf. This is exactly what a lot of people were waiting for, the eminence of the caliphate. For Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi to have declared the caliphate in 2014 in Mosul was a strike of genius because al-Qaeda's idea was let's get already, let's say, the continent of Africa under our control and then we'll declare the caliphate. Baghdadi said, no, 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 we're going to do it the reverse way. We have a little portion of Mosul, we'll declare the caliphate and all the Muslims will come. And so for, we'll have those uh, in the questions and answer, but for all those people that say, look, Islamic State is dead, uh, they have won in the, the hearts and minds of a lot of young people that the caliphate has been created, even though it's a fraction of what it was, it can start again in Southeast Asia, it can start again in the Sahel, it can start again in, in Libya. And that's what they're all about, keeping that idea of the caliphate uh, up and running. So uh, a few things. I'm going to focus first on Europe, then go into Africa, because I, I think that's one of the aspects that is not well known in terms of, of terrorism that, that is extremely important. So. My remarks on, on, on terrorism in Europe will focus much more on what's being done and how security services have been uh, good at and less good at. Uh, just one statistic that came out from one of the studies we did for a, for a think tank. 97% uh, of the French jihadists that carried out attacks in, uh, in France in 2012 were known to the police or security services, 97%. So the security services are doing an extremely good job at knowing who potentially will carry out an attack. They're being put on a list. So whether in France, Germany, or the UK, you have between 20 and 30,000 people that are on that terror watch list. 3,000 of those are deemed extremely dangerous by the services. Uh, the, the same number in the three countries, actually, which is interesting. But at the same time, uh, to basically monitor those 3,000 people, you need 90,000 90, police, 30 per each individual. Obviously, neither France or the UK or Germany have 90,000 police dedicated to going and monitoring those potential jihadists. We're talking about, at one given time, between 50 and 100 that are monitored by the security services whether in France, Germany, and the UK. So they have to make a lot of choices and be right all the time and have the hunch that, look, we think that this individual might carry out an attack, so we're going to put him under surveillance. But that, that's a lot to ask from our security services. Um, I think that's one of the things that we have to look at is the, the menace and the threat has turned from being external to being domestic. And that's one of the aspects that the trends that we saw in 2014 and warned the services about that. Uh, governments are extremely huge machines that have really trouble changing the focus. I mean, they're not like the private sector. If I tell a CEO tomorrow about this country that you should get out of this country, then they'll do it quickly. If I tell a country that they should look at this, it takes six months for them to move from one side to another 
and it's very difficult for them to have a, a triple mind. So in 2014, all the rage within the security services was to go uh, after the potential returning jihadist. That was really the main issue that they were looking at. And we pointed out time and again that the main issue was domestic. And I mean, we're not smarter than anyone, but we read and listen to what the jihadists say. And when uh, the spokesman of Islamic State started saying, look, we have enough men here, please grab a knife, grab a car, and start attacking people in your homeland. Uh, and that will be uh, your jihad, not coming here. When we saw that happening, we had a lot of uh, work done on the potentiality of people going and attacking France, Germany, uh, and the UK especially. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't one of the main aspects that people were looking at, uh, and, and that's the main problem. So when you had the Charlie Hebdo attack, which was the, the main one that started this um, new wave of attacks, the services realized that there was something there and that, you know, incidentally, the Kwashi brothers that were behind the attack were followed by the security services for 18 months. Uh, and the, the monitoring started, uh, ended because nothing happened six months before the attack. Um, and that's one of the things that I really want to talk about is how the impact of what, uh, what we can call the fifth column is going to have on our on our societies and on how we see things. I mean, for me, the most striking case of a terror attack is what happened in, in Paris just a few months back at the Prefecture de Police. You had an individual that was there for 20 years that had the highest security clearance uh, to get information about uh, different terrorists that was under the radar without being under the radar. Uh, because of political correctness, um, his colleagues decided not to single him out when he issued issues of uh, support for the um, Charlie Hebdo attackers. And that's one of the things that we have to remember is that we're not in a society where being silent is, is the issue. You'd rather have people say what's going on uh, without going berserk. But at the same time, uh, that person that killed four of his colleagues uh, was all over uh, the information and was, if you will, one of the uh, most cleared person around. And that, that's one of the things that needs to happen is to look at this. Incidentally, just to give you the statistics, right after this happened, we're now up to 150 policemen that have been either taken out of the French forces or that have been uh, disallowed to carry a weapon because of radicalization. So it means that it was really happening and that nobody was taking it seriously. Uh, and this is a model that could happen anywhere in Europe. Uh, so there's a huge wave of due diligence to know uh, what's going on, who's this person, and it will happen also in the corporate world. Uh, extremely rapidly. Um, that's one of the aspects that I want to look at is uh, also the issue of the terror watch list that we mentioned earlier. I mean, it's a huge issue because the far right has taken over the issue of the watch list and how to uh, protect the country. In a country like France, uh, we have about 15% of the people that are on this terror watch list that are foreigners. They do not have dual citizenship, so they can be easily deported and back to their country. Uh, and that's what the Italians have, have done in a, in a very, uh, very efficient way. Uh, but the French are not ready. So the, the French, when I say the French, I say the French government. One aspect that is important is that you know, 87% of the, the French people are for deportation of people that are on terror watch list that are foreigners. But President Macron has not spoken publicly about this and is leaving the field open for the far right to run with this ID. Uh, and that's one of the problems that we've seen time and again is that when it's logical to do something, sometimes our politicians will not do it because of fear of a backlash. But not doing it, make, making the bet for the far right is not a solution either. Um, 
just to give you an idea of where we're at, because now we're in a lull drum, everybody says, look, the terrorism issue is under the rug, the worst uh, has happened. Uh, I can tell you that in both France and the UK, there's still one major plot being foiled each month. Um, so they, they've been good at, at getting that under, under wraps. Um, and look, other things that, you know, uh, human beings are very good at, at understanding the norm. Uh, now when we see uh, a low sophisticated attack, somebody uh, blowing themselves up in, in Strasbourg at the market or in Lyon near a bakery, look, it's on TV for 10 minutes and then it's gone. Uh, and that's something that you have to remember, which is extremely important. Terrorists do what they do 90% for the media exposure. That's the main aspect. And for them to see that is really the fact that they have to change and they have to do something spectacular. And so whether Al-Qaeda or Islamic State is looking at doing something spectacular in, Iraq, in, uh, in Europe, I can tell you it's the case. I can tell you that officially for the first time ever, the British uh, domestic intelligence have said that there's a 5% chance of either a chemical or a dirty bomb attack in the UK. 5% is a huge number. And 5% th for them to say it publicly is even more of an issue. Um, and I think that's what we have to... Uh, live with is that because of how the media has taken the terrorism issue, uh, now both Al-Qaeda and Islamic State are going to go for something extremely spectacular. Uh, and that's what services are extremely worried about. So the low sophisticated attacks are not uh, an issue any longer uh, in terms of, of this. But at the same time, think about this scenario. I mean, I'm not here to... to uh, to scare you off, but I'd rather people have their eyes open than closed. So uh, this is the scenario that I don't understand why the jihadists have not done it. I mean, I'm not that I'm going to give them ideas, but look, you look at, you look at, let's say you have 10 people that want to try to carry out an attack in London. The main aspect and the, the main issue that could be really the, the tipping point is Imagine 10 people doing 10 attacks in 10 small cities in Germany, for instance. Not in Berlin, not in Frankfurt, in the, in the countryside, in places that you would never think there would be an attack. A guy coming, walking into a bakery, blowing himself up one day. The next day, another guy walking into cinema and blowing himself up. I can assure you that those kind of attacks, even if they're low sophisticated, will have the biggest impact on the economy of a country. Because basically, we'll send the message that you're not safe anywhere. Even if you're a little village, you're not safe. And it's not very difficult for them to do, and it's not very difficult for them to find 10 guys. But it will have a huge impact on the economy. I can assure you there'll be a recession after that. People will be scared at the beginning to go out. And they'll say, look, why would I take a risk to go out if I can get blown up in, uh, in my bakery or, or in my cinema? And, and that's one of the aspects that would make a lot of sense to, uh, for them to look at. Now, a, a, few, a few more things in terms of uh, what we can do and what has happened. Um, I raised the point of Morocco here uh, because in Germany, obviously, uh, there's been a lot of cooperation between the Moroccan services and the German services especially in terms of information flow coming from Morocco. Uh, and we know that Anis Samri, the suicide bomber, uh, not the suicide bomber, the tr truck attacker in Berlin at the Christmas market was singled out by the Moroccan services uh, twice, uh, nine months before the attack, and nothing was, was really done. But what's interesting is that now some countries like Spain, France, and Belgium have taken on board Moroccan counterterrorism officers that work directly, not with the police, but at the police. So you have now uh, people looking at from the inside because uh, in many cases, especially also in France, the Moroccans were the ones to give the, the critical information to, to the French when it came to, uh, to arresting uh, a couple of terrorists. Um, 
I'm I'm going to jump to the Sahel because now that's that's the big thing that uh, is not really well known in, in in Europe, but that's for me the the largest threat uh, that we can think of. We're talking about obviously uh, a region and the continent of Africa that holds the most potential in terms of of the economy, in terms of of the increase in the demographics, and for now, if it's not for France in terms of counterterrorism, there's not a single country that is really looking at uh, defending the countries around the regions. The Americans are present a little bit here and there, but not enough. Uh, I'm not even talking about the Germans or the Brits, but people need to understand that within three years, for instance, there's one country that we have lost in three years, and that country is Burkina Faso. Three years ago, uh, the, the number of terrorist attacks was zero. Last year was 223 terror attacks in Burkina Faso, almost once a year, one, once a day, killing 208 people. Um, and the same is going into uh, Mali, into Niger. Uh, the big one has to do with, with Libya as well. Uh, and that's something that people have to realize that what's happening in the Sahel, because of the migration, because of all those issues, have a huge impact. And we cannot allow Africa to, to uh, come into the hands of the jihadists. And I go back to 2013. If it weren't for the French intervention, Mali would be the first country of the caliphate. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb was 50 kilometers away from Bamako when the president called the, the French president and said, you have to come because otherwise we'll have the caliphate here. Um, some of those things that are happening are really spreading over and having a huge impact. But it also joins up with the geopolitics of it all. And that's, you know, I don't have much time, but I'll join the geopolitics. There are two countries that are basically understanding how important Africa is for the next 50 or 100 years. One is China, the second one is Russia. And how is that important when it comes to terrorism? It's important because, for instance, Russia had no presence in the past 10 years in, in many African countries because it was basically left to the old colonial powers and the Chinese. But Putin made the, the decision of making Africa a priority. Today, there are 17 countries in Africa that have a huge Russian influence. When I'm talking about huge, the way the Russians are, are doing it is extremely smart because they don't need to spend a lot of money. They go to the dictator, the president, whatever you want to name it, of such and such country and say, look, we're going to provide for free uh, your counterterrorism services, your protection, uh, but the free means that you're going to give us access to your mines. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that you have to look at is uh, Russia has been taking a lot uh, of stakes in the mines, but also a huge portion. And without you knowing it, there's a major proxy war between France and Russia in Africa. So Russia uses also soft power to basically push conspiracy theories about France. So uh, the French have 4,500 soldiers in the region. And in Mali, you've seen time and again in the past year, articles written by politicians, by rap stars, saying that the French are there to rape Africa, rape, take our resources away, and the French are with the jihadists. They just pretend that they're fighting them, but they're with the jihadists. Most of those campaigns are financed by Russia. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that you have to look at is this fomenting of chaos is what Russia thrives on. And that's one of the aspects that you have to look at when you look at uh, the biggest picture. You look at Syria, you look at Libya, but you look at Europe and you look where you stand here in Germany. And that's why the terrorism issue works because it's used as a tool by some countries. So Syria, Iran, but Russia as well. So what Putin has as viewed, and unfortunately for our politicians, none of them are as smart as he is and as dedicated as his plan. So 
he wanted to have his uh, base in Syria. He has now three bases, not just one. He wanted to have a base in the Mediterranean. He may get it in Libya uh, very soon because Russia is smart enough to support three different groups in Libya. So they support the government of national accord, the UN one, uh, Marshal Khalifa Haftar, but also they support Saif al-Islam, the son of uh, Gaddafi, who is making a comeback. So the Russians are edging their bets, but also at the same time uh, trying to blackmail Europe when it comes to uh, access to Nord Stream and, and the gas here. Um, just, I have three minutes left. I'll just give you one point that I think is extremely important. There's a canard that is saying that Sunni and Shias cannot work together. We've seen by the release uh, just uh, a few weeks back from The Intercept and The New York Times that Iran uh, has worked hand in hand with the Muslim Brotherhood to create chaos in the West, to create chaos in, in the Gulf. And that's one of the aspects that you have to remember. Uh, the forces uh, that are looking at basically trying to change our society are not just Sunni, they're Shia, and they are really using the undercurrent to work with us. So for me, that wasn't a big surprise for Lorenzo neither. Tariq Ramadan is, you know, works on Press TV, gets a nice salary. Press TV is Iranian TV. Why did no one ask themselves in the services, why would a, you know, an extremist Sunni work in a Shia ch channel where, you know, Shah Haradad, we on Al Jazeera saying, look, we need to kill the Shias more than even the Jews for them. So that's one of the aspects that you have to remember is that you cannot put things set in stone. So when I go and see politicians and I brief them about this and say that, but I thought that Sunni and Shias don't get along. How is it possible that they do that? And I said, they do that because you don't have the intelligence of even thinking that they would do that. And, and that's the main problem that we have here is that we are not as pragmatic as, as they are. And with the two presentations we saw this morning, the Islamists will stop at nothing to get us under their control. And it's not a conspiracy. You have to read their books. You have to speak to them. And we are naive to think that, you know, they are moderate and they're going to go and integrate. No, they have the time. As an Albana 1928, you know, look, they have done it for 80 years. They can wait another 50 years. It doesn't matter. Time is on their side. It's not on ours. And until our politicians understand what the menace is, we're never going to be safe. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating and incredibly well in time. Really impressive. Uh, we're going to have a question, uh, a round of questions here. Uh, we have the, yeah, we have microphones on us. We'll collect uh, three questions together. Please keep your questions short and concise and, yeah, the responses even so. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to that uh, quite alarming uh, perspective we're facing right now. My question is on the situation of the returnees uh, from the IS returnees from the camps in, uh, in Syria. Um, what would be your advice to the German government? Okay. Very short question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have just one short question. Um, how strong was uh, the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood before the civil, uh, the civil war in Syria broke out? And uh, as you have uh, just shown now, um, uh, there can be cooperation between, between Shia and um, Sunni Islam. Um, uh, what about the Muslim Brotherhood? Are there 
also Muslim brothers in Syria who cooperate with Shiites. Um, you mentioned uh, the ES, uh, or not, not the ES, but rather uh, different extremists from Sunni origin uh, telling the, the people, the propaganda, that uh, the West is on the side of the Shias. Would you say that uh, a similar concept was used by the Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, since uh, most of the, the victims of the Al-Qaeda were um, Hazara, and Hazara are traditional Shia, uh, Shia Muslims? Did they use that as well? Okay, we'll take these. I think these. those three yeah. already there, plenty. Uh, Susan, to, to make it um, simple, a few things. It's a conundrum that European governments have to look at. Uh, it's easy for the Americans to say that they're going to take the returnees because as soon as they land whenever, they'll get 560 years in jail because the American judicial system is extremely, extremely strong on terrorism issues, and that's no problem. Unfortunately, our systems in Europe are extremely weak when it comes to terrorism. It's going to be extremely difficult to get proof of what they've done. They all went there for humanitarian reasons. They were all cooks. They never, never used a weapon. They have no idea how a weapon works. There was nothing there. I mean, they were just uh, eating Nutella on, on strawberries. So, no. <laughs> So it's going to be extremely difficult for, for the Europeans to do that. OK. So the French used three tactics. The first one was to use the special forces to try to kill as many French jihadists unofficially there with the Iraqis. The second tactic was to get the Iraqi to take on the jihadists and pay them a million dollars per jihadist to be put on trial in Iraq and be sentenced to death or just to uh, life imprisonment. For now, it's just death. The Iraqi do not want to do that any longer. But there's a guy that we spoke about that two days ago had the miracle genius ID. His name is President Assad. He wants to be the savior of Europe. He wants to basically get all the ones that are in the camps in the, the Kurdish area and say, OK, they're criminals. I told you from the beginning they're terrorists. Here's the proof. Now you need me. I'm going to do and put them on trial. And it's legal because they've done their crimes in Syria. And then it opens up the can of worms that basically we're going to have to pay for reconstruction. And all of a sudden, Assad is reintegrated in the international community. So two other options. International tribunal that the Swiss, the Swedes, the French, the Germans are pushing for. Some in the parties uh, are for it, but that's going to be difficult to, to pull together, but it, that is one of the least bad solutions. Let's assume that they come back. The main issue that you have is triple. We're talking about the kids and women. Most of the women were not cooks. I mean, they were part of the Hezbollah, of the religious police. They took part of it. They saw what they needed to uh, saw. They helped with intelligence. And so to reintegrate and to take those people back, you're taking a huge risk for your society. You're not going to be able to de-radicalize them. The only ones that you can really de-radicalize are the kids. And for Europe to be spending billions of euro on de-radicalization programs that do not work is a waste of money. I mean, across Europe, I mean, even in countries like Saudi or Indonesia, they've tried de-radicalization. The best they got is 10%. And they've spent billions. I mean, in Saudi, you see, I mean, I visited the places they are. My God, it's five-star hotels that they, 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 they've been put uh, in. So you have the risk, a dual risk, a security risk that this person might walk into a supermarket and blow herself up. Or she goes around and she radicalized just one person. She goes into a gymnasium in, in Germany and talk about her experience and with the advance of um, conspiracy theory, she's going to say, look, all the images you saw about Islamic State, about what we did, is not true. It's made up by the CIA, the Mossad. You know, Photoshop, that's how they got it. And so that's one of the main problems, is that a lot of people with that old fake news, but especially in the Muslim communities, they, knew, they have this 
idea about conspiracy, she might convince just one person in that room, and that's one too many. And that's the problem that you have. And we're talking just about the women. Have you seen any uh, male German jihadist or French jihadist being interviewed and saying, look, uh, I've doubts and remorse about what I did, I want to go back. Most of them are hardcore, and what they want to do is continue to fight. If we weren't to bring them here, they would go to Southeast Asia. In Afghanistan, there are 100 French men that went from Syria into Afghanistan. There are 50 French men that went into the Philippines, 40 that went into Indonesia, 200 that went into Libya. So those guys are hardcore. Why would you bring those guys that want to fight abroad to your own country, because then you're making it easy for them to say, why do I need to go to Libya? I can blow myself up in Berlin. And that's the kind of thing that our politicians, for this one, they understand. They know it's a political time bomb. Because imagine tomorrow a returnee perpetrates an attack in Germany. Imagine the backlash against Merkel. People are going to say, but why did you bring them back? Why did you bring this guy back? You knew he was a terrorist. And that's one of the things. Even if you sentence those people, they'll get five years in jail. After two years, they'll be out. Yeah. And we're talking about, I'm, yeah, so, I'm finishing yeah, here. Just to, so we yeah, can get more a, questions. Uh, I mean, she asked me the $64,000 question. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> I cannot answer in one minute. <laughs> so, and the main issue has to do with how many people are going to be already released from jails. In France, in the next 18 months, 400 dangerous jihadists are going to be released from jails. They are totally overwhelmed. They are extremely scared that there will be attacks from those people being released because those 400 are not going to be able to be monitored all the time. And the same thing happens in Germany. So why would you bring even more? So that's it. Second question on the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria. Yes, I mean, to look at some of the re rebel groups on the political side, mostly in Europe, were from the Muslim Brotherhood, especially in, uh, in, in Britain, in the UK, there's a, a big Muslim Brotherhood Syrian community, and they've done a lot of work to push to go after Assad. In terms of Sunni Shia in, uh, in Syria, it's not happening uh, at all, because obviously uh, Assad being a branch of, of the Shias is a no-no for them to look at. I mean, they're, if it's against the West, they have no problem. If it's internal, if the Muslim Brotherhood is going after Assad, why would they try to help the Shias? But if they want to go after the West, yes, let's do it. Third question, excellent question, by the way, on the Azara. But no, uh, we don't know what they did in terms of, of propaganda at the time. It would have made sense. But now, how do we know about what's happened now? Twitter, Telegram, all those jihadists that I was having conversation with in terms of what we're going to do and what are we doing and, uh, and the narrative. We didn't have in this tool in Afghanistan to know, uh, but I don't think they did it in the scale that they did it now. Fantastic, thank you. So thank we'll you. get three more questions in. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for your insight and your expertise. My, my question is about your ranking of the most important developments, and you put the non-intervention in Syria first. So my question is, where would you put the intervention in Iraq in 2003 and the NATO bombing of Libya in 2011 in that context? Because that had direct consequences to the, regarding the situations in the Sahel that you, I mean, you took a lot of time to paint this very bleak picture there. I mean. It, it is super bleak. Um, you said uh, that Shiites and uh, Sunnis, as you call them, work together to get control about Europe, for example. But Gilles Kepel says it will not work because the Muslims in Europe since 20 years, since 9-11, don't... Uh, don't go on the side of the terrorists. So there is no real danger of control. What's your opinion about that? 
I'd like to come back to uh, what you refer to Africa. I'm pretty often in Africa, and I can see the development and the moving, the moving of Islam coming always further, further down to Africa. Um, we have discussions here in Germany, also discussions in Europe, regarding shall we send troops to those countries? This is very contradictory. Would you say, coming back what you said to Syria, the Brits should have come in. You think the Europeans should intervene much more with troops in Africa in different countries in order to stop or yeah, stop Islam wherever possible? Okay, we have three minutes left, so I'm really asking you to oh my. rush through. <laughs> okay, so thanks for the question. Um, I would put the intervention in Libya in the top five, yes. For one thing, because also, not only did it open the can of worms and the model of a civil war that is not a civil war, because to call Syria a civil war is a non-nomer. It's a world war. Every single country is present in Syria. And all are taking sides, all are funding the groups. If you're looking at it, Possibly, you know, Libya could have been resolved by now. But there's on one side Qatar, Turkey. There's on the other side the UAE, Egypt, France, uh, propping up Haftar, and the other one the GNA. And that is making it extremely difficult for different, different groups to talk to each other because right away there's money coming in and they say, look, we give you this money, don't talk to this guy. And that's one of the aspects that Libya is the problem, but also Libya is the problem for Russia. When I talk to my uh, Russian uh, counterparts about geopolitics, they put Libya as their main reason for what's happening now. This, so their uh, issue about the West is that they've been lied to. And for them to sign off on Libya was a big step. And they were extremely... Uh, satisfied that they were part of the international community, but they said that they were betrayed and that they would never go with the West any longer. Uh, since I have three minutes, uh, the Iraq intervention of 2003, uh, we'll talk together right after that because I have two minutes to get the other ones, but uh, Libya for sure. The second question was about... Oh, yeah, Gilles Kepel. So I know Gilles. He, uh, you have to find where he said that because I don't think. I mean, he's, he's of my school of thought that it's extremely dire and that if governments uh, in France are not acting up, then there's a, there's a major problem. I mean, he's, uh, he, he got some of his calls extremely wrong, but uh, some of his calls are extremely good. So on, on this one, you do not need to worry about Gilles Kepel. He is extremely, extremely pessimistic on what's coming. Um, very good question on Africa because it's, it's, a, it's a dual game. Uh, more intervention and more troops, will it make it better? Uh, the problem is that, as I said, every single country, every single conflict is not domestic anymore. It's not this tribe against this tribe. It's this tribe supported by Russia against this tribe supported by the US. This is a world war that is happening in all those theaters. For us not to have a war in Europe we have a war in the Middle East, we have a war in Africa. But we cannot allow Russia and China to take over the continent. So if Europeans have any kind of brains, they should go into it. And I can tell you just one anecdote. When I was in school in Germany 25 years ago, uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, we had a class about colonialism and markets. And the professor told the student, looking at me, because he knew I was French, he said, look, now the war is over, but we have a commercial war to fight in Africa. And we're going to take all the markets from the French, and we're going to see German companies coming into Africa and taking over. Unfortunately, in a way, I haven't seen that. And when you have German mission to Africa or French mission to Africa, it's very difficult to find even 50 CEOs to go there. They have given up on the continent, and this is the biggest mistake. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll move straight to the next floor.